several weeks, months, actually, to be honest. We'll take a break for Christmas, by the way. So we won't be, like, talking about, like, lust on Christmas Eve or something like that. But we're talking about the seven deadly sins, okay? And so we, we just finished up Envy. Um, if, if you weren't here, you're probably jealous. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, if you weren't here, we talked about our tendency to compare ourselves to others and get our, our worth and our value with how we stack up to what other people have, with their giftedness, with all kinds of things about them. Um, and so we need to be aware of that. We need to fight back with gratitude, with contentment, with joy, with accepting the fact that what we have is enough and it's good and it's a gift from God. And we'll t- actually talk more about that to do with today's topic, which is sloth. Okay, sloth is just a good word, isn't it? Just, it's just not a word we use enough, is it? slothful, slothfulness. Like, I mean, if you guys were up here, you'd be wet by now with me saying those words. So, Aiden, did you get the picture? Okay, all right. Well, I sent you a picture last night of a sloth, so I'm sorry about that. We don't have a picture of a sloth. But we're not talking about the animal, the sloth. We're talking, and probably now you're going to try to look one up. Am I right? (laughs) If I see everyone staring behind me, I'll know what happened. Anyway, we're not talking about the, the animal, the sloth, and we're not even necessarily talking about what we typically associate with sloth, which is like a lazy couch potato sitting there playing video games. That's what comes to my mind anyway when I think of sloth. And that's not exactly what sloth is. It could come out in that. It could come out in laziness. It could come out in um, just sort of, not doing anything, but it can actually come out in activism and busyness as well, okay? Let's get beyond the outer characteristics, and we're going to talk about what goes on in our hearts. When we struggle with sloth, it's something that happens inside of us. It's a disposition, an attitude that we take towards life and towards the world. And so if, ne- if envy is a negative emotional reaction towards the good of others, that's what that's what envy we defined it as, then sloth is a negative emotional reaction and active resistance to the good things that God wants to do in us and through us. So it's, it's active resistance to what God is doing in me and through me in the world, or what he wants to do in me and through me. So sloth is like an inner rebellion, okay? It, it's, it's, an, it's a rebellion against purpose, against calling, against responsibility, against relationships and the work that they involve. It can come out in laziness and half-heartedness and apathy. Apathy is a great word to associate with sloth. It uh, comes out in indifference to the world. It can actually look like depression. And, And a lot of what I read made sure to state, you know, sloth and depression are two different things. Depression has biological roots and brain chemistry. Sloth is something that happens in our hearts. But it can come out and look a bit like depression as we, all of our energy is zapped. We, we just can't get up the, or, or we refuse to get up the emotion or the willpower to do the things we're supposed to. But, but it can also come out in workaholism and busyness, all right? So when we use those things as an escape from the things that God has told us to do, that is actually or could be sloth. So if you're here this morning, you're like, I'm busy all the time. I work hard. You know, nobody's going to accuse me of being slothful. I'm safe today. Well, unfortunately, maybe not. If you're a crazy, busy person, it could actually be sloth that's driving you to do this. Um, Anyway, sloth doesn't always resist. Let's see, I have to read this right. This was a confusing sentence when I wrote it. Sloth doesn't always resist doing anything but it always resists doing the right things. Okay, let me repeat that again. Sloth sloth doesn't always resist doing anything. Like, it's not always inactive, but it is always trying to get you to do the wrong things. Okay, so let's take a look at the scriptures and a great parable that Jesus told. If you've been here a while, you've heard me talk about this parable. By the way, uh, we're, we're having some technical difficulties. Oh, there's our sloth. Look at that. Isn't he cute? Um, there are Bibles at the back there. We're not going to put the scriptures up on the screen because we've chosen not to or because we can't. Um, so if you want to grab a Bible right now, 
I'll let you do that. If someone wants to grab a few and pass them around, do you want to follow along? We'll be in Luke 25 right now. Um, that's hilarious. Luke doesn't have a 25. How about Matthew 25? Whew. That was, that was a close one. I thought God had taken a chapter out of the Bible. Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. This used to be called the parable of the talents, okay? But it got a little confusing because we have an English word talent, and really what they meant was the parable of the big bags of gold, okay? Because a talent was a bunch of money back in the day. It was actually a lot of money. So millions of dollars, read, when, when we hear about this, okay? Jesus says, the kingdom of God is will be like a man going out on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags of gold, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a cheery ending, isn't it? Somewhat sobering. Where's the nice Jesus with the lamb on his shoulders? That's the one I like. Okay, so we'll go back past the ending and we'll talk about what the parable means. Of course, the parable is about life. It's about what we do with life. The master is God. We're the servants. We're being entrusted with his gifts, with his bags of gold. Now, what are these gifts? What do they represent? Well, I think they represent everything about our lives, where you're born, your education, your current job, your past jobs, your experience, your skills, your talents, your energy, the time you have, the money in the bank, the house, the car, the toys and technology that you have, your possessions, your vacation, your free time, your skills, everything that, ha that you have, everything that, that makes up your life has been given to you as a gift, okay? Now, there are two temptations to avoid when you think about that, when you, when you come to understand, okay, this is all a gift. The first is we kind of fight back against that, don't we? The, temptation, the first temptation is to give ourselves undue credit, to basically say, wait a minute, not everything was a gift. I worked hard. I slaved away to get this stuff. It's not a gift. I earned this. That's our initial reaction sometimes to this. And, and it's true that, that we do work and we do contribute something. But so much more was a gift in and of itself. For instance, who said that you were to be born in this country rather than in a hut in Africa? Who said that you were going to have the level of intelligence or physical capabilities that you have 
rather than being born somehow with, with challenges. Who was to say that you weren't to get sick? You know, maybe even pass away by this point. Who's to say that you were to have all those little lucky breaks along the way that we tend to minimize, right? We maximize the hard work we've done and we minimize the lucky breaks that happen in life. And the truth is that no matter how hard you've worked, it was God who gave you that ability to work. And so life is a gift. Everything that you have, no matter how hard you've worked for it, no matter how much you feel like you've earned it yourself, the truth is it is a gift from God. The other temptation when thinking about life as a gift is to look around us and we go back to that sin of envy and go, well, how come God didn't give me their life or their life? And we actually talked about this in envy. And, and you get fixated on the fact that you got two bags of gold when the other guy got five bags of gold, and that's not fair. And I love the fact that Jesus is pretty honest about this in the parable, right? We're not all given the same things. We don't all start with the same advantages in life. We're not all given the same lucky breaks along the way. Some of us get five bags, some of us get two bags, some of us get one bag. But the truth is we're not all expected to do the same things. The guy who only made two bags of gold more was given the same praise as the guy who, only, or who made five bags of gold more. And it's the same in our life. There's no use comparing yourself to others. There's always going to be someone who has it better than you, always. Well, there must theoretically be someone at the top of that chain, but I don't know how we'd ever know. But there's also always going to be someone who has it worse than you. There's no point in comparing. What you've been given is what you've been given. And what matters more than anything is what you do with it. Not where you start, but where you end. See, I think sometimes we get caught up in those sorts of thoughts, like, I've earned it, it's mine, or how come it's not like another's, instead of just saying, thank you, God, for this amazing gift of life. But here's the thing. We're not given the gift for our own sake. Our money, our house, our car, our time, our energy, they're not actually ours. At the beginning of the parable, the master calls the servants together, and it says that he entrusted them with his wealth. You know what that's called when you're entrusted with something that belongs to someone else? We refer to that as stewardship. Stewardship. A steward is someone who's been entrusted with the wealth of someone else. And I don't want you to just think money. I want you to think all of life. Everything that's been given to me doesn't actually belong to me. I can act like it belongs to me, but truthfully, it's been entrusted to me by the one who made me, by the one who gave me life. And as a steward, I'm expected to use it in keeping with his values and his principles. And the reason why when the master comes back, they go to him and give an account of how they've used it is because it's still his money. And they were expected to use it in accordance with his purposes and values. And so as stewards, they give an account. It's the same with us. At the end of our lives, and I don't know exactly how this works or, or, or what it looks like, but at the end of our lives, we give an account to God for how we've lived our lives, how we've used what he's entrusted us with. And it's, it's interesting that, that the master doesn't seem particularly hard to please. The guys who did something with what they were given, who accomplished something, are praised. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been trustworthy. And so I'm going to give you even more. And I'm not sure that this is just an end of life thing. I'm not sure that this isn't an ongoing reality in our lives, that when we're faithful with what God gives us, he gives us more. But however you look at that, the point is that the master, that God is not particularly picky. He's not nitpicking everything that they did and saying, well, why didn't you make more? He's just happy that they did something. And the only one that he really has critical comments for is the hole digger guy, right? The one who just says, you know what, here you go. It's a little dirty, but this is exactly what you gave me to begin with. And you know, aren't you happy? I protected what you gave me. I kept it safe. Well, maybe this parable is teaching that God's highest priorities are not that we protect what he's given us, not that we keep it safe, but maybe that we risk it. We invest it. 
that we use what he's given us wisely, that we do something with our lives. It seems to me like the sin in this passage is simply doing nothing. The sin is not investing our lives, not doing something with them. Now, that doesn't, you don't need to over-spiritualize this. Jesus doesn't say it's all about, you know, how much you go to church. It's not about how often you read your Bible and pray. I'm not saying those things aren't important. But it's really about being productive, isn't it? About this, this, this parable is about doing something useful with your life. It's interesting if you go back to the Garden of Eden, and you think of like this paradise and this sinless environment where everything was perfect. God still gave Adam and Eve something to do, to tend to the garden, to be fruitful and multiply, to name the animals, to partner with him in making the world a better place. And there's something deep within us where we are called to do that, to make the world a better place. And that's what this parable is about. It's about the fact that God has entrusted each of us with all kinds of stuff. And it matters what we do with it. Now, that third guy, it's kind of funny, isn't it, how he says, and we, we probably look at him kind of judgmental, like, right? Like, okay, you knew that the master was kind of harsh and strict. You said that. Well, why not work even harder then, right? Like, why dig a hole? It seems like you almost knew you were going to get in trouble. But don't we experience that sometimes in our own lives, too? The guy says, I was afraid, so I hid it, which put me in mind of the fact that that's what uh, Adam and Eve said in the garden. We were afraid, so we hid. There's something that when we get scared or overwhelmed or confused or we just don't know how to sort life out, that instead of trying harder, we actually withdraw. We actually hide. We bury stuff in a hole and go into self-protection and self-preservation. And that is actually the gist of sloth. Sloth is being given something important to do and then not doing it. It's either burying your head treasure in a hole and just leaving it sit, or maybe it's ignoring it while we're busy doing other things. Uh, the theologian Thomas Aquinas back in like the 1200s said, Slosh, sloth, <laughs> slosh is something that happens in a couple months. Sloth is an aversion to the divine good in us. Sloth is an aversion to to the divine good in us. It may look like laziness or busyness on the outside, but on the inside, it's a rebellion. It can feel like defiance. It can be like, I know that I should be doing that, but I'm not going to do it. Anybody ever have that inner dynamic happen, either in small things or big things? I know I should, but I'm not. It can also feel like despair. What's the point? doesn't matter. Life doesn't matter. I don't matter. I can't contribute anything anyway. So I'm just going to go dig a hole and put my stuff there. I, I think it comes out in all kinds of different areas of life. Uh, marriage. Sloth in marriage is that thing that makes you settle. That makes you, when you think about doing something nice and romantic and loving, and then you just don't do it. You don't have the energy. You don't, you don't make the effort. And you slip into monotony and half-heartedness. I bet that sloth kills as many marriages as adultery. You stay together, but you just give up. You let things die. I think sloth enters parenting. Those of us who are parents often know the right thing to do as parents, and we just can't get up the energy. <laughs> I don't know if you can relate to that. This is something that I uh, like, oh, I know I should do this or that. Or, but man, it's the end of the day. I'm tired. Maybe tomorrow I'll do the right thing. Or maybe it's when you sit on your phone and you know you should be spending time with your kids, but you just escape into your smartphone playing Candy Crush for two hours. I, I've been there. Um, I think that actually sloth is the cell phone sin. That thing where we, that thing that we feel where we're like, I know I shouldn't play another level of Candy Crush, but I'm going to anyway. That is sloth. Okay, that's what it says. When you know you should be doing something better, more useful, more productive. I think it enters our work, whether it's like around the house or in our job or doing, you know, yard work or whatever it is. It's that temptation to just do a half-hearted job. I said half-hearted. Uh, to sort of cut corners, to procrastinate, 
to resist the responsibilities and duties that have been given us, to turn our blind, blind eye to problems, you know. Spirituality is probably the area that this directly attacks most often. That's where the, the ancient writings tend to deal with sloth the most, is in our spirituality, in our relationship with God. Uh, one of the authors I read talked about it being a resistance to the demands of love in our relationship with God. And they compared it to this marriage where, you know, in marriage, yes, you say I do, you make the commitment, but that commitment is expressed in the small things day to day, week to week. It's the same in our relationship with God. We can be passionate and on fire and committed to God and so grateful to him for all he's done, but it really is the small things in life where we express that commitment. And that is where sloth attacks. Um, I think one example is, now this is not one I can personally relate to because they make me come to church on Sundays. But when they don't make you come to church on Sundays, I know so many people who they say, yes, church is helpful, it's good, it's, it's, it's good for my life, it's a great way to start the week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a bigger effort to go. And then you get up on Sunday morning and like the world is like jello and you're like, I can't go to church. My toe hurts. And, you know, all kinds of different things enter in your mind. And you're, and you're like, well, what is that? Why do I have such a resistance towards something that I know is good and I know, that I've said is something I want to do? That's sloth. And one of the authors said that it's, a, it's actually the resistance of our flesh, of our sinful Nature, the part of us that still wants to do what we want to do, as I said a few weeks ago, resisting what God wants to do in our lives. And the battle is fought right there in that decision that we make. We go on to something I can relate to, and that is daily discipline, daily devotions. How many of us have said at some point, yeah, you know what, I think my life would be better, and I think it would be honoring to God if I were to take a little bit of time out of every day and spend that time in prayer Bible reading, meditation, thinking about what God has done for me, gratitude. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. Does that sometimes seem like the hardest battle you've ever fought? And you're like, why is this so hard for me to do something that I want to do? And that's the essence of sloth. It's a resistance to what God is doing in and through us. Uh, one of the other areas where I think this comes into play a lot is in expressing love for other people, whether that's someone in need that, that we feel like maybe we need to go help, volunteering for an organization where God, you know, has put it on our heart, giving money, doing something good for other people. It is really easy to procrastinate that, isn't it? How many of us actually do what God puts on our heart when, when we know it's something good and loving and kind? How many of us do that right away without saying, oh, maybe, maybe that's a good idea. But first, let me watch TV for a couple hours. Anyone? I, I, apparently, I'm the only evil one here, so. <laughs> yeah, I've lost you now. So, Well, the ancient writers recommend things like manual labor and perseverance and self-control and just getting out and helping others. But I want to just talk about two concepts, and both of these are kind of churchy words, and I think they're held in tension. And one is the word vocation, and the other is the word Sabbath. I want to talk about both of those. Somewhere in the middle of those is a healthy lifestyle. And sloth is fighting against both of those. So let's talk about vocation first. That's a word that we associate with work, right? It's a word that we associate with someone's job or career or whatever, their vocation. But we don't use that word very much anymore. And the reason is because we have adopted sort of a secular mindset when it comes to work. We've adopted sort of a cynical worldview where we look at our jobs as just that, as jobs. There's something that we do to make money so that we can do the really important stuff in life, right? That's how we tend to look at our work and our career. Well, it hasn't always been that way. There was a time when people referred to their jobs, to their careers as vocations. And if you look at that word or you listen to that word vocation, it has the word like vocal voice in it, doesn't it? That's because the literal meaning of the word vocation is actually calling. And so Christians have over the centuries up until fairly recently made a pretty big deal of the fact that each of us has a vocation, each of us has a calling as something useful that God has given us to do in the world. Nowadays, we tend to narrow that down to just ministry, right? Like 
I have a vocation. I have a calling because I'm being called to be a pastor. But the rest of you just have jobs. You ever think that way? That's not how it has always been. It, it used to be that everyone had a vocation. Everyone had a calling. Mine happened to be ministry. You know, yours might be to be a cashier at a gas station. And right now that's your vocation. That seems a little silly. But people used to view work as something sacred, as something that God had given you to accomplish on the earth. Now, the truth is, all of us choose our jobs. Even I kind of choose my own job, right? Like, I, I don't have to be a pastor. There's no one forcing me to do it. And I've, I haven't tried this, but I, I expect that if I wanted to quit, I could quit. And God wouldn't drag me back forcefully because he respects our right to choose. And so each of us on one level chooses our job. And, and you might look at your job and go, well, I didn't really feel like God called me to do that. And that's not really what it's about. It's not about an audible call. It's about the fact that each of us is called to do something useful in the world, just the same way that God gave Adam and Eve something useful to do in the beginning. He still expects us to contribute, expects us to do good in the world. And I think that almost every job does that, contribute something to the world, whether it's waiting tables or tending a cash register, or designing houses or whatever it is, most work contributes. And if you're doing something that is actually evil or destructive, then maybe you should look for a new job at this point. <laughs> but if it's not evil to and destructive, it's part of your calling to do something good and productive in this world. Now, it's not just about our paid work, okay? It's not just about doing something for money. It's about the contribution we make to the world, whether it's through a job or whether it's through family or whether it's through what we do with our free time or whether it's through our volunteerism or our relationships. It's not just about having a job. That's good news for those, you know, who are retired or who are full-time students or who are unemployed or who can't work because of a disability, we're not exempt because of that. We still have a vocation. We still have a calling on our lives. So what's your calling? How do you know what your calling is? Well, here's an easy way to figure out your calling. What are you doing right now? What is the state of your life? Where has God placed you? If you have a job, what job is that? If you have a family, who are they? Hopefully you know. Uh, if you're in a neighborhood, what neighborhood is God put you in? And you think, well, God didn't put me in those neighborhood. God didn't put me in this job. I chose it on my No, God always starts with where you are. Okay? It doesn't matter how many wrong turns it took for you to get there. God always starts with where you are. That is your vocation. That is your calling in life. Start with where you are. And then add in those things that God has put on your heart, the passions, the gifts that, you're, that you've kind of dug a hole and stuck them in those also represent your vocation, your calling. And so for some of us, maybe it's time to pull them out of the hole and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do with this thing that you've given me? You know, you've given me this gift of, I don't know, fixing trucks. How do you want me to use this in the world? How has this become my calling, my vocation from you? But the point is not the, the specifics of it. The point is beginning to look at all of our life as something that is sacred. It's been given to us as a sacred trust. Colossians 3, 23 to 24 says this, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Isn't that an interesting? Paul's actually saying whatever you're doing, whether it's a paid job or whether it's a volunteer job or whether it's mowing your lawn, do it as if you were doing it for God. And he actually says that you're going to get a reward for that. Now, I don't know, you know what that'll be, whether it's an extra chocolate in heaven or but whatever it is. But there's this idea that what we do with our lives actually matters minute by minute, moment by moment, day by day. And you go, well, yeah, but Paul didn't understand my job. Paul didn't understand how menial and pointless and worthless my work is. And actually, Paul is writing that passage to slaves. Okay, back in Paul's days, there were, there were people who were slaves who were owned by someone else, and all they did was what they were told to do. 
And they did some very menial jobs. And they had become followers of Jesus. They were now part of this inclusive community of the church. And Paul says, okay, so you're stuck in slavery. All right, that's a tough situation to be in. But here's a way to, to, to deal with that as if it were a sacred calling to slavery. He says, work at it with all your heart as if you were serving the Lord, as if you were serving Jesus. So if Paul can write that to slaves, how much more does that apply to you and I, right? To look beyond our circumstances and understand that what we're doing matters and the attitude with which we're doing matters. All this is based on the truth that God created each of us with purpose, with intentionality, that we weren't just random accidents that showed up, you know, just because our parents' DNA mixed in a certain way. This is all rooted in the belief that God made you and God made me with something in mind and that he has a purpose for us, not just one purpose, but many purposes. But those purposes are not accomplished automatically. They're accomplished as we cooperate with him, as we say yes to what he wants to do in our lives. And sloth will resist that. Sloth will work to say no to the purposes that God has for us. And whether that's by distracting us with busyness, whether that's by making us just sit and play video games all day, sloth will work against what God is trying to do in and through us. Now, we have a sacred calling to work, to do something with our lives, to be productive. But on the other hand, we also have a sacred calling to rest. We're not always called to be working, okay? Now, this concept is called Sabbath. And I think a lot of Christians today feel like Sabbath is this ancient, unrealistic idea that nobody could possibly live up to. A whole day without doing anything. We're just too busy nowadays. Or maybe they see it as a big burden, an annoyance. I know that when I grew up, I felt like it was this imposition that my parents imposed on me as a way of limiting the fun that I could have one day a week. Okay? And I kind of felt the same way about God. It was like God's way of forcing us to be bored for a day. And uh, about 10 years ago, as we were actually preparing for this church plant, I heard someone explain Sabbath in a different way. And I heard it explained as a day free of obligation, a day where we could set aside our to-do lists and all of the things that we ought to do on any given day and be free to do what we wanted, what brought us joy, what expressed freedom, what, it, what <laughs> caused us to have fun, kind of like what he was talking about in the video. That God is not always as about us being serious or productive, but that actually 24 hours every week, we should take time to just be and enjoy life. I want to go back to, by the way, this, this was uh, not just a minor command, like a side note. This was in the Ten Commandments, like alongside don't kill people, you know, don't steal from them, and take a day off, like the top ten most important things to do. Deuteronomy 5.12 says this. This is within the Ten Commandments. It says, Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, set aside different other, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Okay? Not against working. There's a place and a time for work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, and just to clarify what he means by that, neither you, nor your son or your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Didn't say anything about your wife. Interesting. <laughs> I just noticed that. No, I'm just, I think it's addressed to men and women, right? Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Isn't it interesting that he connects taking a day off to the fact that they were brought out of slavery? You see, when they were in slavery, their whole worth and value was measured by what they could accomplish, what they could do, right? In any given day, that's, that's what their worth was tied to. And God knew that coming out of that slavery environment, it would still be their temptation to measure their worth by what they could accomplish. And so he says, because you were slaves and now because you're free, you need to take a day just to be 
without having all those obligations, without having that pressure to get things accomplished. You have to learn that the world keeps spinning even though you're not doing anything. That doesn't sound like a lesson that we need today, right? I don't know if you ever feel like you're a slave to your to-do list. You're a slave to what you need to get done before winter comes or you know, by the weekend, or for me, I'm in school right now, slave to the syllabus and the due dates and the deadlines. We judge our worth so often by what we get done, by what we accomplish. And here in the Sabbath is a sacred calling to rest, to stop. Actually, Sabbath literally means ceasing, stopping. Let it go for a whole day. Enjoy your life. It's a gift from God, not just to be used and to be productive, but to be enjoyed, to have fun, to spend time with your family, with your friends, to take a hike, to maybe sit and veg and play video games for a couple hours. Whatever brings you joy and rest and restoration. And so there's a rhythm to life, a rhythm of work and rest. And in here it's represented as six days and one day, six days and one day. And in that society, it was really important what day it was because everybody rested together. In our society, I'm not sure it's important what day it is. In fact, I think each of us needs to wrestle with this on our own terms. How does Sabbath come out in our lives? I don't think it's just about one day a week. I think it's about one hour a day or a couple hours a day. I think it's maybe about vacations. In fact, God didn't just command them to take one day a week. He actually had several weeks through the year or several holy days or festivals where they stopped working and they celebrated. So there were like divinely ordained vacations and camping trips in the Old Testament, okay, where God commanded them to rest. And so this idea of Sabbath, that God calls us to rest, that we're commanded to stop for a day, or for an hour, for however often we work that out in our lives. So that's the tension. We're called to work. We're called to rest. We're called to be productive. We're called to be unproductive. And both are important. And sloth will attack both. When we're resting, sloth is going to fill our heads with all kinds of busyness, all kinds of distractions, all kinds of guilt. You should do this, and you should be doing this. And when we're working, sloth is going to say, ah, do it half-heartedly, or ah, maybe you need a nap, or whatever. Sloth is resistant to what we're supposed to be doing at any given time. So that's, that's the end. We, we hold those things in tension. You have to work them out in your own life. Next week, we're going to talk more about it. But this week, I would challenge you to watch that. Watch in your heart. When is it that you're tempted to do what you're not doing? Is it God actually maybe calling you sometimes to rest? If you're overworked, then maybe the most sacred, the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. If you're underworked, maybe the most spiritual and sacred thing you can do is get out and go help someone and do something. We listen to the Spirit's voice. We listen to His lead. Be aware of that dynamic inside of you. If you have questions about it, I would love to hear them. I'd love to discuss them next week. Come next week, and we'll be prepared to figure out where the rubber hits the road. How do we apply this stuff in our life? For now, let's pray. God, I thank you uh, that you have given life as a sacred calling. That whether we have acknowledged that or not, Everything we have is a gift from you. As much as we've worked, we've struggled, and we've done our part, we couldn't have done it without the gifts that we were given to begin with. We couldn't have done it without your help along the way. God, help us to use what we have right now. The past doesn't matter. What matters is what we do with what we have. And I pray that you would guide each of us individually to be faithful. That we can get to the end of our lives and say, here's what I've done. I've been productive. I've taken what you've given me and I've I've made more of it. 
And we can hear those incredible words, well done, good and faithful servant. Help us to see the sacredness of life, the holiness of what we do day by day, even when it doesn't seem very holy. Help us to see the sacredness of rest and the sacredness of work. Help us to feel and sense and acknowledge your presence in both. In Jesus' name, amen. And have a great week. And like I say, if you have questions, you want to talk more about this, I'd always be happy to uh, interact with you on that.